we wait until they attack us because of this whole notion of momentum. What is he going to do? How does he convince American mothers to allow their sons to fight in this world war? So what he, what scheme does he come up with? Because Congress is now Congress, the senators and representatives who want, they're mostly interested in being reelected. They don't care about being great leaders, and so they're taking their cues from those mothers and wives. And brothers and sisters, we're not sending our sons to fight. So what does he do to somehow overcome Congress's opposition, reflecting the opposition of the American people, to get involved in this war against the Nazis and the Japanese? The, um, he's able to make the case when the Japanese attack. Well, before that. Oh, before that. Before that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Well, first of all, he starts with Lend-Lease. He, 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 he goes on this fireside chat. It's kind of like homespun talk to the American people. And he says, if a neighbor came to you and said, my this is an exact words, he said, my house is on fire. Could you lend me all of your hoses so we could try to put the fire out? Because eventually, if, my, if I can't put the fire out of my house, it may spread to yours. Would you lend them your hoses? People are thinking, well, of course we would. He said, well, why don't we lend our arms to our allies in England while they're fighting the Nazis? So they gave all these World War I uh, uh, naval ships and guns and airplanes to the British. He also traded um, British colonial possessions in uh, the Gulf and in Latin America. Britain would give us these places and we'd give them money. Bases for battleships, he called it. So this leads to, to another aspect of good leadership. It is when you come in because pursuing a noble goal identifying the obstacles to achieving that goal, and coming up with methods to overcome the obstacles that are consistent with the nobility of original goals, you also have to depend on luck. And so what luckily had, this is an ironic, kind of ironic use of the word luck, what luckily happens to Roosevelt? The uh, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. The decision is taken out of his hands. And now, finally, the American people are enraged. But what about, what about declaring war on Nazi Germany? They declared war on us. That's right. They, we never declared war on them. They declared on us. Hitler declared war on us when we declared war on Japan. So luck is another element of great leadership. Lincoln and Washington. Roosevelt had it to a certain extent. Now, all of these guys had failures. You remember some of Osborne's, can you think of one of Roosevelt's great failures? Where he didn't pursue, where in his pursuit of a noble goal, he went over that hair's breadth. Um, he tried to add two additional justices to the Supreme Court. So these nine justices, or at least five of the nine, had been bought by all these industrial interests. We didn't care what happened to one third of the American working people. They were making their money. And so they were defeating the New Deal propositions by a five to four vote. He became very, very uh, upset and anxious. And he lost his cool, he lost his restraint. So he tries to pass a law um, augmenting the Supreme Court to 12 justices and allowing this <coughs> Congress to, uh, having Congress allow him to, to appoint three new justices who would be new dealers. And so now it would be a 7 to 4 vote, 7 to 5 vote. 
So why does this go? Why does this go over the line of nobility? Uh, because I mean, he's trying to fulfill a noble goal. Pass laws helping, right? Ninety percent of the American people were suffering during the Great Depression. But you couldn't do this. What was evil about it? Because you can't force you? you can't uh, uh, you? Uh, the the leader or the uh, or the um, in this case who's the leader? Oh, Ro Roosevelt. Well, the president yeah. can't overtake what, what, what branch? The judicial. Because of what constitutional principle? Uh, checks and balances. The separation of powers. So he was in direct violation of one of the central propositions of the Constitution of 1788. He also was under great pressure at the beginning of World War II from racists on the West Coast who were afraid that Japanese Americans who loved to take photos with Nikon cameras uh, we're going to send these photos of American bases back to Emperor Hirohito. That really was the fear. And so tremendous pressure was placed on him by governors of western states, U.S. representative of western states, with a large percentage of the Japanese. These are American citizens, by the way, but they have Japanese ancestry. Um, U.S. senators mayors to round up all of these uh, Japanese Americans and put them in the holding camps further in places like Arkansas where they would stay for the rest. These are American citizens I want you to understand where they would stay for the rest of the war so that they wouldn't take pictures of American bases and send them back and use Morse code to, American hero Ito, Emperor hero Ito. So how how did how well did Roosevelt uh, resist the, the, those pressures? Not. He gave in, signed an order, and uh, almost 150,000 of those Japanese Americans were rounded up. And by the way, when they were rounded up, and it was sent into the interior of the United States as far east as Arkansas, they lost their homes. They lost their businesses. They lost everything they had worked so hard to maintain. So, at the beginning of the Civil War, Lincoln, seeing all these people dying, tried to urge um, leaders of Africa, free African Americans, to voluntarily go back to Africa. He said this would be a way to end the war. And those who wouldn't voluntarily go back to Africa, he would sell them to miners, mining corporations in Latin America. Did you know that? When he would work with the slaves in Latin America, but not in the United States. This would do away with what he said in the cause of the war. And he actually blamed these black leaders. He said, it's your fault all these people have died. I don't you understand it. Washington, after the uh, American Revolution was over, he became president in 1788. A tax had been placed on whiskey in the United States. And it was pretty onerous. The tax was supposed to pay the soldiers who never were paid while they were, who left their farms, and never, but never were paid while they were fighting for the continental army. In the far west, western colonies of the United States, they hadn't become states yet. In western Pennsylvania, farmers were taking grain and making it into whiskey, and they were selling it in order to pay their bills, in order to pay their loans to banks to keep bills there. So these taxes on whiskey were particularly onerous on these farmers in western Pennsylvania. So these farmers, 
hundreds of them were disobeying federal law. So Washington, who by this time is an old man, gets on a horse, raises an army, and starts marching to western Pennsylvania to defeat the farmers who refused to pay the whiskey tax. The American people really were pissed. They felt that this was a <coughs> abuse of the power and the trust that they had put it in. We're not defending the farmers, but isn't this a bit overkill? Trying to kill these guys because they're trying to make a living. That's Washington's uh, reaction to what goes on in history, what's called the Whiskey Rebellion. So all of these guys made mistakes, just like Pericles made a mistake. Some of them didn't have the luck that Roosevelt had in World War II, because it's just luck. Ultimately, you have to judge these guys on the, on the entirety of their careers, not just on one or two uh, mistakes, which as human beings they were going to make. So you asked me to talk about leadership, that's it. I'm very impressed with Aristotle's explanation of how people understood Pericles' success, by and large, during his elected leadership of Athens in the 4th century BC. I know you have questions, so why don't you start it? Since this is new to you, why don't you start it? Have you heard any of this before? Um, no, not well, then, really. So you must have a question. Well, I guess the obvious question is, um, what do you think today's... Uh... That's, that is the obvious question. Someone as pretty and smart as you have to go out with a guy like this. <laughs> Which means, please. Um, what do you suppose, remember here were the steps, here were the steps. Pursue an abstract ethical ideal. Step number one, two. Identify the obstacles to, the, to uh, achieving this ideal. And then three, come up with a, a method for overcoming those obstacles, which are going to play on the purity of the ideal without going over that hair's breadth. I keep thinking of the rabbit breathing. So of those, and then luck, of those three, which is the, which is the three that in the United States and 2015 that we really don't understand very much. No, no. Let, let her do it. No, you, you can come next. Of those three, which is the one you suppose that just for Marx, for Marx is you Americans, we just don't take it seriously. We just laugh when you talk about these things. It's a difficult, you asked a great question. It's a, diff, it's a, difficult, uh, it's a difficult question to answer. That's why it's a great question. It's, there's no question about it. There's no, we don't. Do, we laugh at ideals. We really right. don't. We're just average people, and we have made a norm of average of the average. We really have. And when you talk about ideals, people think you're trying to con them, like you're trying to sell them a Bible or something like that. No, we really do. Americans are infamous materialists. And materialists only care about the, themselves and the here and now only. And when you talk about ideals to them, they just laugh. Some con is going on or something. You're trying to manipulate me. That's exactly it. We, so, so this kind of this kind of standard for leadership doesn't stand a chance in contemporary America. Because it can't even get past the first step. It can't even get through past the first step. By and large, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, it can't even get past them. It's very sad. Think of all the, the, the candidates for presidents over the last, for as long as you've been alive. The one who came closest was Obama. He knew, as we all knew, everyone should know it, around 10% of Americans have no health insurance. Half 
had no health insurance. They tend to be the poorest of us. Those are unemployed. So when you're poor and have no health insurance, by the way, how do people get their health insurance by and large? Through their, through their employment. Yeah. Through their employees. But you have to work 40 hours a week. So even those who are employed, <coughs> their bosses love to do one of these things. You work 38 hours and 59 minutes, so you don't have to. They don't have to pay for health insurance. So these people who are either unemployed or work in menial jobs, who don't have health insurance, tend to be the sickest of all Americans. They need doctors the most. Why do they need doctors the most? Because they can't go for maintenance health care. They can only go when they're essentially dying. Right? Um, so when they're dying, where do they go? The emergency room. Yeah. Well, they won't treat you at the emergency room unless you fill out a form with your name and address and who your insurer is. So how do they get Osborne past the nurse to be treated if they uh, don't have a house? Fake names, fake address. Yeah, that's right. So the hospitals, they will just, they just take the loss. They, what, what do they care, right? They just take the loss, right? So what do the hospitals do? Charge it. We, we pay for the difference. So you, so what, uh, what Obama saw in this country was, ten percent of Americans with no health care, gaining health care when they're about to die. And the rest of Americans subsidizing their near-death treatment, which oftentimes doesn't work. They're too sick by now because they can't get their yearly maintenance. And they're going in for their yearly checkup, whether they're sick or not.